In part three of our drug-resistant TB series, we will describe the different ARV options when managing a patient who is co-infected with HIV and drug-resistant TB. These recommendations can be found in the Rifampicin-resistant clinical guide released by the National Department of Health in November of 2019. See part one and two of this series about the latest on diagnosis of DRTB, key drugs and regimens for patients who are also fluoroquinolone sensitive. I'm Dr. Madeleine Muller and let us get started with this Yandisa tutorial. Many of our patients diagnosed with DRTB have underlying HIV and good management of the HIV is essential for a good outcome of the TB. Integrated management is strongly recommended with the patient receiving their ARVs and their TB treatment at the same time and at one facility. All patients diagnosed with TB must have an HIV test done. And if they are known to have HIV, make sure you have a recent CD4 count. And if on ARVs, take both the CD4 count and the viral load. It is essential to ensure that our patients get to viral suppression. The guideline gives leeway to start the ARVs between 2 to 8 weeks with our patients who have a CD4 over 50. But in practice, we try and initiate patients within 2 to 4 weeks of starting TB treatment, prioritizing those with a low CD4 count. The only exception, as always, um, are TB meningitis and cryptococcal meningitis, where we wait at least 4 to 6 weeks before initiating ARVs to reduce the risk of a serious iris. Let us take a closer look at our regimen options for patients who have both RRTB and HIV. The challenge with prescribing ARVs to our HIV patients are several significant drug interactions. The most problematic of these is the interaction between efavirenz and bedaquiline, and all patients on efavirenz must be switched for the duration of the bedaquiline treatment. Now we could replace the efavirenz with its close compatriot, nevirapine, but this is problematic in patients with higher CD4 counts. And lastly, it's recommended to avoid using sidovudine and linezolid together as they can both cause bone marrow suppression. So what are we left with? Luckily, we have a new ARV option that have become available in the last six months. Our new drug of choice to use with pedaquiline is dolitagravir, an integrase inhibitor that forms part of the new recommended South African first-line regimen. The challenge with the dolitagravir is that early evidence suggests that there might be a small risk of neural tube defects when women conceived whilst taking dolitagravir, and therefore women need to be thoroughly counseled about ARV options. Our drug-resistant environment is slightly different than the normal as we strongly recommend women to not fall pregnant whilst taking their DRTB treatment. This is both due to the risk of the illness and the large number of drugs that they will be taking. Dolitagrapher is therefore an appropriate choice for new initiation in most patients weighing over 20 kilograms. But it is still important to counsel women that when they eventually are off DRTB treatment and they want to fall pregnant, they would need to go to their health facility um, to discuss whether dolitagrapher is still a good option. Be sure to record that conversation in your clinical notes as per the ARV guidelines. Dolitagravir will also appear in a new, simpler and stronger second-line regimen, and so we will also aim to change any patient who is biologically failing or who has defaulted treatment to the new second line if possible. Let us work through a few different scenarios. We will start off with patients who had never been on ARVs and will be initiated for the first time ever. Remember, you will start the TB treatment first. For all our men, women and adolescents over the age of 10 years old and weighing more than 35 kilograms, we can give the new fixed-dose combination of Tenofova, 3TC and Dolitagrava. Remember to counsel your woman in childbearing age about possibly switching the Dolitagrava if they eventually want to fall pregnant and record that conversation in your clinical notes. If the child is under 35 kilograms or under 10 years old, we cannot use Tenofova. And therefore, for children between 20 and 35 kilograms, we use Abacava, 3TC and Dolitagrava. Children under 20 kilograms will still be initiated on the traditional Abacava, 3TC and Lipinavaratonavir um, as per the new ARV guidelines. 
Remember that we need to check the renal function for patients initiated on tenofovir. And the new ARV guidelines also clarify that the Kuhnan Barrett formula must be used in children between 10 and 16 years of age. And note that we expect that EGFR to be more than 80 mils per minute um, for our adolescents. Our next group of patients are more complicated. This is the patient who has taken ARVs in the past but has defaulted treatment for one or more months. They now present with drug-resistant TB for the first time and they're not on ARVs. Now most patients in South Africa would have been on tenofovir, FTC and efavirenz, that traditional fixed dose combination, before they defaulted. The challenge is that we cannot risk combining dolitegravir with any NRTI that may have a mutation which means that the new TLD, as it's called, is not an option in patients previously exposed to ARVs and not currently suppressed. So that means that patients that used to take the traditional first-line um, tenofovir, FTC, and efavirenz will need to be switched to tenofovir, 3TC, and lupinavir, ritonavir. This is actually a stopgap second-line regimen, because remember we can't give AZT due to the linezolid. But once the linezolid is completed and the HB is over 10, we can switch them to the new second-line regimen, a robust and easy-to-take AZT, 3TC and dolitegravir, which can also be safely used with pedaquilin. This is especially important in those patients who are only going to be on linezolid for a couple of months in the short regimen. For patients who interrupt their second line, that is AZT, 3TC, lupinavir, ritonavir, we again will need to switch that AZT to tenofovir to reduce a risk of bone marrow suppression on the linezolid. Unfortunately, we cannot use dolitegravir for these patients, and we will switch the tenofovir back to AZT once that linezolid again is completed and the HB over 10 grams per deciliter. For our children less than 10 years and less than 35 kilograms on the traditional abacavir, 3TC and efavirenz, we'll still need to be switched to abacavir, 3TC and lupinavir, ritonavir. Again, remember dolitegravir not being an option. Depending on their previous history, they may need to be discussed to decide what to do when that regimen with pedaquilin um, is completed. But most problematic are the children less than 10 years um, and 35 kilograms on a second line regimen. So preferably we don't want to use AZT, um, but tenofovir is not an option. Stavidine would actually be an excellent temporary choice and is what is recommended or if you are able to procure some. Um, but else the only option is a backover, which is not ideal and is not specifically mentioned in the guideline. Our third scenario is the patient who is already taking ARVs and has now developed drug-resistant TB. And these are by far the most fiddly to sort out, so I will cover adults first and then have a separate slide on children. Let us start off with all those patients on the standard first line tenofovir, FTC and efavirenz. As per the new ARV guidelines, if they have a viral load that is lower than detectable, then they are eligible for the new tenofovir, 3TC, dolitegravir fixed dose combination. And this is the perfect option with pedaquilin. But remember to counsel your woman in childbearing age that when they complete TB treatment and they want to fall pregnant, they will need to discuss their ARV options with their clinic. More complicated is the patient who has a viral load over a thousand. We cannot simply switch to second line due to the risk of linezolid and AZT drug interactions. In these patients, you will use tenofovir, FTC and lupinavir, ritonavir as an interim measure, again as a stopgap second line regimen. Once the linezolid is completed and the HB is over 10 grams per deciliter, the patient can be switched to the new second line, AZT, 3TC and dolitegravir. Interestingly, the NCAC recommends discussing all the patients with a viral load between 50 and 1,000 and doesn't give specific recommendations. In practice, we will switch these patients to tenofovir, 3TC and lupinavir at the beginning of treatment, but you'll have to consult um, with an expert about the course of action once the bedaquiline is completed. Now the same principle as above apply for adults that's on an abacavir based regimen. If the viral load is suppressed, they can be changed to abacavir, 3TC and dolitegravir. If not, you will use a temporary abacavir, 3TC, lupinavir, ritonavir until they can be switched to that new second line. If you have patients who are already on second line, similarly to patients who have defaulted second line, we're going to have to temporarily switch that AZT to tenofovir until the linezolid is completed and the HB is over 10 
and then we will switch them back to the AZT-based regimen. And remember, you can't use dolutegravir in these patients. Now let us quickly look at the children regimens, um, but the principle stays exactly the same. Children who are suppressed on a back of a 3TC antifavorins, over 20 kilograms can be switched to a back of a 3TC and dolutegravir. But if they're under 20 kilograms, you would still need to use that lupinavir ritonavir. Just remember, if they're over 35 kilograms and over 10 years, they actually qualify for TLD. Children who have a viral load over 1,000 and is over 20 kilograms will be switched to a Bacovir, 3TC and Lupinavir Ritonavir until the linezolid is completed and then switch to the new second line with Dolutegravir. But if the child is under 20 kilograms, it becomes complicated. Stavidine can be used temporarily if available and the child switched to AZT, 3TC and Lupinavir once the linezolid is completed and this is the same for children that's on second line. Although it may seem fiddly at first, there are clear ARV options available for our patients on DRTB treatment. Use the charts to guide you until you feel confident in optimizing your patient's ARV regimen. In part four of this series, we will start to focus on the management of some of the key adverse events seen in our patients on DRTB treatment.